I want to start by thanking uh, Dean Gonzalez and, of course, President Castro and Vice President Lamas and everyone else for the very kind invitation to share my work on student success. A big shout out to two of my former students when I was chair at Iowa State that you have recruited here, Susana and Nacho, and their baby Nayeli. And thank you to the College of Sequoia uh, folks that are here, uh, top administrators, I see. So thank you for being here, and to all of you. Let me begin by telling you how I enter this work. Uh, that photo that you see there is my former home in Laredo, Texas, where I spent a lot of time growing up, 517 Galveston. And as you can see, we, we didn't have very much. That home is still there. Every time I go to Laredo to visit my family, I drive by there just to remember the old times, so to speak. But we didn't have very much, but we had hopes and we had dreams. And one of my hopes was that I would get a college education. But that was not a tradition in my family. My parents separated when I was about three or four years old. And um, my mother worked really hard to help the family survive. She had a job uh, that, well, she had several jobs, but her last one was being a waitress at the best restaurant in Laredo called the Western Grill. And uh, she worked from 10 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning every day for $12 a week. And so that's kind of what we survived with and a little bit of money that my dad would, would chip in. Um, but we again, didn't have very much. And so how does a kid like me, who, grow up, who grew up in these circumstances, now have the privilege and the honor of speaking to audiences like yourselves at distinguished colleges and universities throughout the nation? How did I do it? I'm often asked. How'd you do it? And I know that there are many in here who share a similar story. And I want you to think about how you did it. Because that's been the question that I've had, and this is why I want to share some of the research that I've done to indicate that students like me succeeded, oftentimes with strengths, with assets, with things that keep us going, that are not acknowledged by most faculty and staff and administrators in higher education. I want to illuminate those strengths because they are key to what helps students like me to succeed. 2044, how old will you be in 2044? Ya viejitos. Will you be around is the key. Uh, I don't know that I'll be around, I'm kind of old now, but some of you will. And uh, it's going to be a great year because that is the year that people of color would become the majority in the United States. It's going to be a very interesting sight to see in many ways, economically, politically. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to that. I hope that I'm around to see it. But at the same time, many of these students that are growing up right now and that are in the first grade and the second grade and they're coming to Fresno and other places, um, they're not necessarily the ones that are best prepared for higher ed. They don't go to the best schools. They don't have the best libraries. They don't have the most you know, well-educated and credentialed teachers. I mean, there's students like me. I went to Martin High School in Laredo, Texas, where hardly anyone went to college at the time. No one really encouraged me to go on and make something of myself. And we weren't expected to really become very much. So we've got to turn that around, because many of the students that are coming to colleges and universities have these kinds of experiences, and they want to succeed. They want to make something of themselves. 
So one of the first things that we have to realize is that we have to move away from what is often called a deficit-based paradigm. Oftentimes when faculty and staff and you know, other folks at work in colleges and universities begin to discuss the issues of low-income first-generation students who are among the first to go to college like me, the narrative begins with, oh, we can't do very much with these students. They're culturally deprived. Um, they are at risk. Uh, it's too overwhelming to work with these students. Their parents don't care. It is a narrative that is based on deficit thinking. It's, a, it's as if these students had nothing but problems to bring to higher education. And I'm going to tell you that this needs to stop. We need to now operate with what I call an asset-based framework. Because this deficit-based perspective that views these students as very limited, unable to learn, unable to succeed, is, is really holding us back in terms of working on student success. Can you imagine if Berkeley thought about its students that way? Can you imagine if Princeton thought about students with this deficit-based paradigm? Can you imagine if Yale thought about these students in this deficit-based paradigm? So why is it that the default narrative for discussing low-income students is all about deficits? We have to change that narrative. So I want to tell you a little bit about a study that we conducted at the University of Texas in San Antonio, which is my home base. And uh, this is a study that we were looking at Latino students in particular. We're, we're an HSI, an Hispanic-serving institution. And we wanted to find out a couple of things. One was, what are the positive and negative aspects of the college experience for Latino students? And secondly, what were the assets that these students employed to become survivors and to move past the obstacles that they confronted. How'd they do it? How did they do it? And so we interviewed 47 students in focus groups. And then from there, we took out six students that we interviewed one-on-one. -on -one, and we videotaped those. So let me begin with what we learned about the college experience for Latino students at UTSA, which is very similar to the experience of many students at different colleges and universities. Two things. There's an upside to going to college, and there's a downside to going to college. Oftentimes, we think about the upside. And certainly, these students talked about the upside. They were excited about being in college. They were excited about you know, get, you know, meeting new friends. They were excited about the perspectives and the new things that they were learning. And um, they, that really made them feel good. They had really positive things to say about UTSA. They were excited about meeting with diverse students. You know, that's part of the transition to college. It includes an upside and a downside. All transitions include that up and down side to it. When we get a new job, we're like, oh my god, this is a great thing. I'm being paid exactly what I wanted. And then six or eight months later, we're like, oh, they didn't tell me I was going to do that. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, they, that guy is making more than I. I've been here 10 more years. And, you know, it's an upside and a downside, right? I mean, when we find a new partner, it's like, oh, my God, you know, this is the best person, you know, and I'm going to marry him and all that. Get married six or eight months down the road. Well, you know, I didn't know he snored, you know, all this kind of stuff. So you get it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you following me? There's an upside and a downside. College is no different. Okay? So this is the upside. Now let's talk about the downside. The downside includes what Gonia Saldua, feminist theorist, calls un choque, a cultural collision. It's a clash of two cultures. These students are coming from worlds that are very distinct 
from the world of college, the world of the family, the world of their peers, the world of their communities, the world of work. And all of a sudden, they get thrust into Fresno State or UCLA or the University of Texas. And that world of college is very different from their home realities. And so they experience that culture clash, choque. That clash is marked by a number of things. One is liminality, which is a fancy word for you know, being in between, neither here nor there, ni aquí ni allá. You got one foot in the home world and another foot in the world of college. You know, and so, you know, students are caught between these two worlds being right there in that middle space, that liminal space. Another aspect of the downside to college is separation anxiety. Many students are the key person in the family after the father left taking care of their brothers and sisters. Um, and they talk to us about, you know, I, I, I feel bad because I can't be there anymore to help my mom. And it just made me remember when I was in college and, you know, my mom would tell, I would say, tell my mom, oh, I have a lot to study. And she would say, ya vente, hija, para que estás ahí? You know, just come home, you know, get away from all that. She didn't understand what I was going through. But I had that guilt because my mother expected me to work after I graduated from high school because she was tired. And so when I told her that I was going to college, she was like, what? You know, uh, and so I made sure that when I was in college that I always sent money home. To this day, I send money home. To this day. So separation anxiety is another problematic aspect about that transition to college. Another one is dislocation and relocation. These students are dislocating from their home realities to relocate in the world of college. But they don't dislocate completely. They still have these connections with their peers. They still have these connections with their families. And so they're moving back and forth, okay? And they're doing this, they're, they're going through this tough transition with very little help because most folks do not recognize the problematic aspects of the transition to college for low-income students. Another aspect has to do with experiencing what the literature calls microaggressions. Microaggressions, these small jabs that hurt, like you speak with an accent. What's that music that you're playing on the radio? Why are you speaking Spanish? Are you really good at math? What are you doing in this classroom? You know? And this continues through our life. I, mean, I, I remember I was at the University of Michigan, all right, working on my doctorate. And this student came up to me and she said, you know, Laura, you're pretty smart. I have to tell you that when I first met you, I thought you were kind of dumb. Okay, Microaggression. Faculty member at Michigan, again, doctoral program, submitted a paper. He tells me, did you really write this paper? I mean, it's really good. Do you write this way all the time? And I said, yes, I write that way all the time. Microaggression. So these are things that students go through that are very painful, that are very painful, and they have very little help in working through the tensions associated with the transition to college. So here is a chart that basically depicts what I'm talking about. At this end, you see the worlds of the student, the family world, the world of their native country, because sometimes they would go back to Bolivia or Mexico or Puerto Rico, wherever. The world of their barrio or community, their spiritual world, the world of work, world of their friends. And then they're moving on to the world of college and meeting up with these challenges of liminality and experiencing microaggressions and separation anxiety, etc. So that's one thing that we learned about the college experience. It has this upside and the downside. The second thing we learned has to do with 
the strengths that students used to survive that are often unacknowledged. And we called them in the report that we did, ventajas or assets or conocimientos, funds of knowledge. We worked with a theoretical perspective that Tara Yoso, who's now at Michigan, developed. She's calling it the community cultural wealth model. And in her theory, she states that students have strengths. For example, familiar, uh, familial capital, social capital, navigational capital, resistant capital, linguistic capital, and aspirational capital. And all of those capitals combined constitutes the student's community cultural wealth, the wealth that they bring to college and that they use to succeed in college. So we wanted to find out, are these students talking about these strengths, these, this, this, these forms of capital? And indeed, they did. The students had high aspirations. Um, I remember interviewing this young man, his name is Uriel, and he and his young brother would talk about her someday they would become like the Castro brothers in San Antonio, Joaquin and Julian, uh, very well-known you know, political figures. And they wanted to be the same way. You know, they had these aspirations of not only becoming these well-known politicians, but bringing something back to their communities. Language. Some employed two or more languages, and they were able to operate with different modes of expressions, one way to talk with your family and another way to talk in college. Family, a model of strength and determination, and they benefited from the example that was set by their parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles. I know I benefited from the example of my mother who worked really, really hard uh, for very little to make sure that we had something to eat every day. And those tough examples really are the kinds of things that made me stronger. And to say to myself, that's not going to happen to me. I am not going to repeat this history. I'm going to shatter the history of my family. I'm going to become somebody. Um, social, um, a very important asset, they form study groups. Um, one student formed a table tennis club, and that is where students would come and get a hug and, you know, eat together. And, you know, this, you know, they studied together. It was just there was a lot of interactions, and th that peer interaction is extremely important. Navigational, tremendous asset. Remember that they're operating in liminal spaces, neither here nor there. Okay, and they were able to navigate themselves, figure things out, again, often with very little assistance from anyone. That's kind of how I did it. No one asked me, hey, you know, you need help. I kind of figured it out. Okay. Navigational uh, is another form of capital. Resistant. They were able to overcome these microaggressions that I talked about. They were able to be overcome their poverty circumstances. We discovered some new forms of wealth, one that we call ganas, or determination, or perseverance. They really were determined to succeed. You know, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to I'm gonna make sure that I finish. The other one is giving back. This is, I find, like a spiritual nobility of these students who wanted to earn a degree not just to hang it on the wall, but because they wanted to put something back into their community. I'm doing this because I want to help others. I want to be a doctor because I saw my mom suffer from cancer, and I want to find a cure for that. It was all about giving back. And to me, that is a phenomenal strength that students have. Spirituality and faith, another very big asset. Many of these students came to the interviews with crosses and religious bracelets, and they turned to God when things got tough. 
And they also had a sense of meaning and purpose to their lives. And finally, an asset that we call pluriversal, which is about holding multiple and competing systems of meaning and tension. I was undocumented, and now I'm documented. I'm Mexican, and I'm American. I can speak this way with my family, and I can speak this way with my professors. This ability to hold two things that are very different, put them together, and make it into a whole. Pluriversality. So these are the assets that we found in the students that we interviewed in San Antonio. I'm working on a new book right now that hopefully should come out in the fall. It's called The Latino uh, Student's Guide to STEM Careers. And we're presently analyzing the, some essays that students wrote about their journey. They all have completed their journey. They're now you know, in a STEM field. And we wanted to know, how did they do it? And sure enough, here are the assets, very similar to the ones that we found at UTSA. But you know, at the top, I put some assets that I find particularly interesting about STEM students that we didn't find in, um, in the UTSA uh, cohort. Uh, this sense of wonder and curiosity. From a very early age, they wanted to figure out how things worked. You know, they were asked, why? Why? Why do, why do these things figure like that? They wanted to know the answers. They had this sense of discovery. They wanted to know how do things work. They also want to give back. They have this sense of altruism. They want, to, they want to be like an engineers without borders and doctors without borders. I mean, this is a very, very strong asset. Uh, they're justice-minded. They want to make things right in America. They want to make things right in their STEM field. And there's a study that was done in 2013 with African Americans, and sure enough, the same assets came out for African-American students. Um, and so it is these assets that, again, need to be very well understood, because we not only need to know that these students have strengths, we need to work with those strengths. For example, take the asset of giving back. How would you incorporate that in your learning assignments? perhaps through service learning, perhaps through learning communities. We need to leverage the assets that these students have. And don't just say, oh, well, they have them. No, no, no. Leverage them. Figure out a way to use them in the teaching and learning environment, as well as in academic and student affairs. Let me give you an example of a community college transfer student. Her name is Sylvia. And this is her profile. She's a, a transfer student that came to UTSA to finish her uh, degree. She's a Generation 1.5 student. That means she uh, did some of her schooling in Mexico and, and the other part of her schooling in the US. Born in Juarez, previously undocumented, married, no children, first generation, low income. No one in her family, no one, had gone to college. Now, oftentimes, if you show this profile to college administrators and faculty and staff, they'll say, oh, she's not going to make it. Look at that. She can't speak English. You know, she, you know, she didn't go to get all her education here. She's got all kinds of issues. She's not going to make it. But look here. Sylvia was now a fourth-year student at the University of Texas in San Antonio. She graduated in the top 10% of her high school uh, uh, class. She had attended two community colleges before coming to UTSA. She had an Associate of Arts with an emphasis in math and physics. She was now majoring in mechanical engineering, and she was planning graduate work in chemical engineering. So this student, who many people would say, mm, you know, I, I, we, we can't work with her, Look at her. Look at what she's been able to do despite the obstacles, despite her circumstances, despite not having a lot of encouragement at home to finish 
a, a, a college degree. So here's Sylvia's journey on a map. You, be, you see here number one, she begins her schooling in Juarez, Mexico, grades K through 7, comes to San Antonio, and graduates in the top 10% of her class. Number three, she goes to my alma mater, San Antonio College, to, uh, for one year. She comes all the way back to um, California and goes to Solano Community College and gets an AA in math and physics. And then number five, she comes back to uh, Texas and was majoring in mechanical engineering and chemistry. Look at all of the dislocation and relocation that this student did. Okay. Look at all of the different contexts that she needed to navigate. Look at all of the different you know, policies and practices in Mexico and Texas and California that she had to figure out. Look at her navigational assets, her ability to do this with very little help. She's a superstar as far as I'm concerned. She's a superstar. You know, this is a, a, a tremendously intelligent person, very intelligent. So um, I've got a couple of videos of Sylvia so that you can hear a little bit about her experiences. Here she is about talking about living in multiple worlds. College is different, very different. I, I see it as I have my college life and I have my personal life. Is when I'm at school, I have, I'm like in school motion. I know how to speak to people about courses and how to do projects and what I plan to do for the future. I wanna go to graduate school, I wanna do this and that. When I'm with my parents, there's no school talk other than how are you doing and how long it's going to take for you to graduate? It's, they just, I don't think they fully understand what I actually do at school. All they see is that I'm going to school and I've been married, I don't have any kids, how long is that going to take? That's pretty much what I'm getting from my parents. And I just, I just think they just don't know. So it's like two different worlds. I live in multiple worlds. <laughs> And here's an example of giving back, putting something back into society. It's scary. Because <laughs> that means if I'm one of the first, I'm pretty much the one setting up the path for the ones that are coming behind me. And that means that whatever decisions I make or whatever path I choose to take, it's not only going to affect me, but it's going to affect everyone coming behind me, whether it's my sister, my neighbor, or just any female or Latina that's you know, the next generation. And that's pretty scary, because it's not just me anymore. Let me move on now from discussing the strengths of these students and what helped them move forward to another very important aspect of helping students to succeed. And that's what happens in the classroom. It's faculty, how many of you are faculty here? Okay, good. Um, what happens in the classroom is as critical as what happens outside of class. And what we hear today uh, is the importance of what are called high impact practices. Things that the research has shown uh, really work with students like applied learning. And in fact, these students talked about that. It was, they, they, they wanted to learn the theory and the content, but how do you use this in real life, is what they said. Deep learning experiences in and out of class. I hear this again and again. We need deep learning experiences, but what does that mean? What are deep learning experiences? I'm going to give you some examples of that. Validating experiences, affirming students as being capable of doing college-level work. Study groups, I talked about the importance of that and help, having students work together. Learning communities, very important uh, pedagogic strategy. Capstone courses, these experiences that, that really result in a project. And research with a faculty member, 
Uh, that's very big in the STEM fields, uh, very important. Um, so let me talk to you about a relatively new teaching and learning approach that is called contemplative education, which is a deep learning experience, but it's called contemplative education. And what is it? Contemplative education is a blend of what I call pensar, or to think, and sentir, to feel. It's about the whole issue that we are whole human beings, intellectual, social, emotional, and spiritual, and that a deep learning experience needs to tap into all of that as much as possible. So I'll be at Naropa University in their, next week, and their whole mission is contemplative education. And I'm going to talk at Naropa about the blending of contemplative education with social justice issues. But that's a whole new keynote. Okay? Uh, so contemplative education is going to blend rigorous academics. Don't think I'm talking against uh, academics, because I'm not. Okay? We're going to take the rigorous academics and blend it with what are called contemplative practices, such as meditation, yoga, mindfulness, poetry, music. And you don't do all of that in one shot. You know, you're going to select which is really the, the, the best way to blend the contemplative practice with the, um, the rigorous academics. Um, so let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one of them is Dr. Alberto Pulido, who teaches at the University of San Diego. And he has a project that he has in his sociology and ethnic studies courses. He calls it the Cajita Project. I love the Cajita Project. I've used it with my graduate students in student affairs. And basically, a Cajita is a, a box. And uh, what he has is students uh, create a box, and they have carte blanche as to what that box is going to look like and to put artifacts in there that represents who they are, the culture, the meaningful people in their lives, etc. cetera. Um, and here's Dr. Pulido talking about the Cajita Project. Um, so this box here was done by um, a student named Valerie Barra. And um, the title you can see on the top, she, I, I usually ask students to write like a narrative, which the students here today did a great job in. And it's called My Life as a Mestiza, Valerie Parra. And um, the little that I know about it, the, the, the discussions that we had about it, was that, um, was that she is part, she considers herself part Chicana and part Apache. And so when you look at the imagery in terms of the symbols, you see some of the traditional symbols that you would see in terms of being Mexicana or Chicana and, and that whole process. But then you see some of the Native American influence. And she does, she did all these kind of different symbols around here. You can see, you know, Christian symbols and Native American symbols. Um, up on top, which you can't get access to, there's an actual um, field of, 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 a, of agricultural field, there's an eagle that's been carved in, there's a horse, there's some Native American symbols as well. And um, I think it just captures what, what the students were talking about in terms of those dualities and living in those multiple worlds. Um, what he has done in this classroom, and that's just one example, he does many other things, but take, for example, if you wanted, if you were teaching a, a course in political science or history or ethnic studies, that you would take a social justice issue, for, exa for example, uh, assisting students to find a deeper sense of meaning, purpose, identity, and self-worth, or connecting students to their communities. And you would blend that issue to address that issue with intellectual, rigorous academics, conducting research about the history and struggles of, of uh, ethnic racial groups, interviewing community leaders, doing research papers, etc. And many of us just stop there, because we all know how to do that. But what Dr. Pulido does is he goes further, one step further, to include contemplative engagement tools, such as the Cajita Project. There can be many examples of arts-based projects that could be employed. 
or reflective tours to sites where social justice themes are highlighted. Uh, some faculty take students to uh, murals, to the Holocaust Museum, to the Civil Rights Museum, to the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, where students get hands-on reflective experiences about a topic that they're studying in class. This is an example now of deep learning using contemplative education. Let me give you another example. Oh, before, I, let me show you some cajitas. This is a student of mine. He's now a professor at Vermont. Um, his name is Vijay. And uh, when I first gave this assignment, he didn't know what to do or what his cajita was going to look like. And one day, he saw his mother with this old suitcase, and he said, oh, I'm going to throw this away. And, and she ran after him and said, no, 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 don't throw that away. He said, why not? It's all torn and dusty. And he said, you don't, she said, you don't understand, Vijay. This suitcase is the suitcase that carried all of our belongings when we moved from India to the United States. And that became his cajita. You'll see there the little sweater he was worried, uh, wearing when his grandfather, his grandfather passed away and the grandfather was holding him. Um, books that have made an impact on his life, etc. And I have many pictures of what students have constructed as cajitas. Again, they're going to vary. This young lady, uh, her cajita is this wrap. And she selected this in memory of her deceased grandmother, uh, who was, had experienced the civil war in, Nigeria, in Liberia in the 90s. And she tells the story of how soldiers would invade villages, and the women had to carry their most prized possessions with them, and they had to leave at a moment's notice, and they would wrap them around this, this wrap. And so, in memory of her grandmother, that wrap is her cajita. And here is an example. This just happened last year in my um, Foundations of Student Affairs course. Um, this young lady worked in the fields when she was just a child, and that is the hat that she used to wear when she worked in the field. I'm telling you that when you do this project, and you know, I, can, I have a whole PowerPoint on just this project, and it's just so deep and so meaningful um, that, in, in essence, these students keep their cajitas in their offices. Vijay has his cajita in Vermont now, and he's a professor there. Another example, this is Dr. J. Herman Blake. He's retired now. He's an African-American studies professor. And Herman is one of my mentors. I love him. He's a, a powerful speaker and thinker. Uh, and some of the tools that he has employed in his African American Studies course are audio narratives. He has students listen to tapes, uh, photos. He has students look at photos. And you'll see when you see his video and music. Uh, he wants students to learn content but he also wants them to reflect about what they're learning. It's one thing to say, okay, let me, let, me, let me look at the facts of what happened during the whole civil rights movement, and it's another thing to get really engaged with what happened. And here's what Dr. Blake does. I use in the class some of my own material, my own research. I have them listen to, for example, when I talk about slavery, I have them listen to an interview done in 1968 with a woman whose mother was a breeder. And it was her mother's job to have babies. And this woman talks. She was the 15th child of this woman, born just after peace declared, as she put it. She was, I think, 94, 98, or something like this. And I have a picture of her, which I show along with the transcript. I want to tell you, you can't hear that and walk away without thinking. When I get to talking about terrorism and violence, I use about six or seven slides 
from that book without sanctuary. And I raised two questions. Why do they lynch people? And then I showed the pictures of the crowds who came to enjoy the spectacle, including young children. And one student wrote an essay saying this course is not only about learning, this course is about thinking. And you think all the time. I use music because the music was used by the people to illustrate these points. So when they hear this woman whose mother was a breeder, I play for them the spiritual. Lord, how come me here? I wish I never was born. When they see those slides about how people have been misused and mistreated, I let them listen to Nina Simone singing Strange Fruit. I just gave a lecture on the Civil Rights Movement. And at the beginning of the 20th century, I had them listen to the spiritual, Lord, I couldn't hear nobody pray, talking about the loneliness. So to break it down in a history class or a political science class or you know, whatever class, you would identify what you want to cover. In this case, I put social justice, social justice issues. What kinds of things are you going to do to engage students intellectually, intellectual engagement? And then to go even deeper, what kinds of tools are, are you going to use for reflection? And in his case, he uses photos, films, and music that capture the experiences of oppressed people. Now, you've got to think about your teaching and learning assignments, because this now is going to get you to work on a deeper learning experience for students. So here's what I call an ecology of contemplative practices for social justice, all the way from autobiographical essays, contemplative photography, uh, journal writing, uh, meditative experiences, slam poetry, ethnomusicology, dance, uh, drumming, guided imagery, art space projects, service learning. I mean, these are just some examples of what can be done. Here's an example of contemplative education in STEM fields. Let's say that you wanted to examine the impact of the California drought on low-income communities. The academic project would be to examine the rising price of water or the quality of water, you could then design a service learning contemplative project that includes visits and interviews in low-income communities and involves students in journaling and reflections about their feelings as they engage with their communities. And you might involve students in developing art-based projects to share with class, perhaps a documentary on what they learned or some poetry or music that they develop as a result of the experience. There is training, if you're going to do this, and I talk about this in my book, Senti Pensante Pedagogy. One of the key things is having our own contemplative practice, whether it be yoga or journaling or poetry or meditation, whatever it is. If we're going to ask students to reflect, then we need to do that as well. A social justice orientation, an awareness of diverse student backgrounds, a deep understanding of contemplative pedagogy and professional development. So when I talked about deep learning and how contemplative education gets us to deep learning. And I wanted to call it something. And so the faculty that I interviewed, and you saw Dr. Blake there and, and Dr. Pulino, I asked them, what do you call this pedagogy? And they didn't have a name for it. And a student from UCLA came to my office when I was in Long Beach, and she said, you need to read Eduardo Galeano's book. It's called The Book of Embraces. And she said, I think you'll find the name there. And I opened this part of the book that's called The Celebration of the Marriage of Heart 
and mine. Why does one write if not to put one's pieces together? From the time that we enter school or church, education chops us into pieces. It teaches us to divorce soul from body and mind from heart. The fishermen of the Colombian coast must be learned doctors of ethics and morality, for they invented the word senti pensante, senti pensante, sensing, thinking, to define a language that speaks the truth. And so this is why I call the pedagogy Senti Pensante Pedagogy. It's really created not by me, but by the fishermen of the Colombian coast who learn to work with the sea to fish using their brains and their heart, their intuition. They kind of figured out the currents and the, the time of the day without having gone to school or anything. They kind of figured it out. And they said, somos sentipensantes. We are sentipensantes. And I love that word. And so that's why the book is called Sentipensante Pedagogy. So here is Sentipensante Pedagogy. You've got to focus on the thinking, the pensar, the intellectual development, the feeling, the sentir. And all of that is activated by contemplative practices, by leveraging student assets, and by focusing on the education of the whole person. This, I believe, is a pedagogy that has the most potential to help students stay in college. They want to find an exciting teaching and learning environment. They want to learn the content, but they also want to feel it. They want to experience it. They want to get deeper. And so we're going to need training to do this kind of work, which has not been provided to most faculty and staff. This isn't just for rich kids. And believe me, they're getting this education at rich colleges. This is for every college and university in the nation. Deep learning experiences. <clears throat> and so I end by sharing with you that I always get inspired by these students that I interview. They lift me up because I know that I was one of those kids that could be flipping hamburgers in Laredo, Texas. But here I am today to share this work with you. It's my honor and my privilege to have shared this work, and I hope it helps you, at least in a small way. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. It's been a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.